Hi, I'm Valerie. And I'm Taylor. And welcome to Whimsy Gossip, where we talk all things fantasy and our favorite ways to escape reality. Today's episode... Today we have Jo, or you guys might know her as Hi Lady Jo. She is a cosplayer, content creator, and one of the hosts of Wine and Wingspan podcast, and well-versed in all things Bryce Quinlan. <laughs> Welcome so to the show! To be here. Yay! <laughs> We're so excited. You have no idea. We are so excited. We love Hi Lady Jo. Um... We have had the pleasure to get to know Jo on like a personal friend level as well. She was actually able to come to our um, Chapter 54 Whimsy Gossip premiere. And that's where we got to meet her in person for the first time. And it was amazing. And, and she, she came as Bryce. came as Bryce. Freaking Oh, my like, gosh. Cannot think of a better person to close out Crescent City 3 than Hyla Jo. Um, yes. So which is that is what we're going to be talking about today is Part 3 of Crescent City 3. So we are deep diving into this, I guess, ending of Crescent City. So yes, there's so much to get through, so much to talk about. I have like a page and a half of things. <laughs> um, I honestly, going through the review of this or like getting like, like my outline together, I was like, wow, this ending kind of felt, I don't know, it felt really rushed. So, like, I'm really excited to kind of get into it because I'm like, that happened fast. Wait, that happened really fast. I'm like, yeah, I feel like this was a lot longer when I was reading it for the first time. So it's really interesting to to go back and look at all the things that happened in part three. Yeah. So, Joe, what are your overall opinions and thoughts for Crescent City 3? Just, Just overall, what did you think? So I loved crescent city three i know that there the community is very split on this book um i think that when i went into the book um i kept in mind that crescent city three is the aqua war of crescent city so this is not like an Akamath situation mm, there's no yes. like like the love story has been told so now we're getting into like the nitty-gritty of like political stuff and so i love that so that I loved Akawar a lot. So I kind of kept that in mind throughout this, throughout the entire book. Um, a lot of people felt like, oh, this wasn't very Bryce, but I actually really loved seeing a new side of Bryce. So there was like a lot of that world building things that I really loved. And I just love Bryce Quinlan so much. Like I'm a very much a character first kind of girl. So seeing some like character development in Bryce, even this far into the series was like really awesome for me. So this was like a five out of five star for me, which I know is probably controversial because a lot of people didn't like super, super love this book. But in the context of it being like a third book, I loved it so much. I loved the action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and the beginning of the book was probably I've never looked part. at it that way. Like yeah. it was an Aka War because I love Aka War. I definitely looked at it the same way. Like, because that's what I was saying. Like, bef um, like it's the trilogy. Like it's one, two, three. It's very similar to the one, two, three in Akatar, which... I actually think I critiqued more though than like loved because um, like we're following a same similar formula I feel like and I'm like Sarah mm -hmm. let's do let's do a little variation here like just different than yeah. like it's very similar but then like Throne of Glass was like th so different than both of the series so different and so now I'm also like kind of sad because I feel like book four of Crescent City is not it's going to follow the same track as like a Silver Flames where you know we're not gonna get Bryce. You might get anymore. Rune, Rune and Lydia. I, I really think that like in that. in Throne of Glass, yeah. I kind of imagined like Throne of Glass, Assassin's Blade, and um, Crown of Midnight as like those three books as Akatar, and then like Air of Fire and Queen of Shadows is like Akamath, and then Empire of Storms and um, Tower of Dawn were more like an Aka War. Like they're very like getting the facts strategy moving from place to place like there's a lot more of that and a lot less like time to like sit and talk like the f like air of fire where they're basically just talking for like the whole book so like that's kind of if she follows a certain formula but it's definitely very apparent with aka war and cc3 like they are parallels with the war camps and yeah. we're moving here and we're dropping this person off and we're moving here and this person's in danger. Like it was very much the same, but I don't know. Yeah.
Yeah. I still have so many waters. I don't think it's the end of Bryce's story. I think that Bryce, I think that there are some things at the very end with the God Slayer rifle and Rune, and uh, not Rune, Hunt pulls out at the very end, not to like get ahead of ourselves, but he pulls that statue out of Thur. Oh yeah. We'll which is, there. that that's like a whole parallel. And so to me, I'm like, well, this almost feels like Sarah being like, it's not over yet. Like there's still like this, it's come full circle, but it's not like we're not done, you know? And I, I don't think that, no, yeah. <laughs> I think that there's more to it. Cause that's kind of how the end of the first one felt where it's like, okay, now we're happy ending. Like Bryce and Hunt get to go live happily ever after, but that was not the case. So I, and the same for Rune. Yeah. And that's uh, where Rune, I felt like it was like favorite. wrapped up with a little bow. It's too good to be true. Yeah. Honestly. I feel like <laughs> I, I feel like Crescent City One was wrapped up with a really nice bow, but then I, I do well, I mean, I do feel like and we'll get to this too by the end of the episode, so we're definitely jumping ahead, but I feel like Crescent City three was wrapped up with a really nice and pretty bow too. Like with the bonus chapters, like I feel like like everything was like everyone got there happily ever after. So I just I don't know where we go from here. I don't trust like but that, we'll Sarah. That. We'll get to all I don't of trust that. like that. <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's I have just have no idea what's going to happen next. Like there's no I don't know. So like that's that's like interesting, but it also scares me because I'm like where do we go from here and what's going to be entertaining going forward? I want more people to die. Yeah, of course. That's why I'm suspicious of CC4. So I did want to quickly touch on what we do have going on real quick. Um, so just, and you know, hi lady Joe, you know, you can just kind of come along for this little journey here for just a second before we dive into the outline and start from part three of Crescent city, like how we're kind of about to launch auditions for our next fan film Eek. and like the feelings surrounding Ooh. that. And this, by the time this episode goes out, we will have, opened up auditions and that is insane um like to tell you like so, there are tears behind my eyes like just talking and thinking about this you have no idea <laughs> like uh, yeah so I just kind of wanted to give us like a moment to discuss like how we're feeling right now and like also give people the awareness of those who are listening to this episode that's coming out that auditions are open and um they're on our website and um this is insane. Like it's this, this is literally this, insane. This is insane. So We're, I bet future us are probably so overwhelmed, and all of our storage is probably gone at this point. Um, <laughs> from hopefully all the submissions, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I um, I'm feeling all the things. So shout out to Hello Ness Aubrey. She has been a massive help to us. Um kind of making sure everything is staying organized. Um, she is the queen at that, just a queen. Literally reach out oh, to yeah. her at Once Upon a Chilier, um, if you want any help in that realm or anything, essentially. She's so multi-talented, multifaceted. But anyway, um, she's been helping us out to get everything kind of ready to go um, for auditions because we were going to use an official casting site. We ended up going away from that one they weren't going to let us post auditions until July, which is so silly. So silly. And to finding out that for every person that wanted to audition, they would have to pay a fee. And we did not like that. So, um, was not cool. So, um, we're ending up doing it through our website. We're really excited. Um, Val and I have some say in the audition process, but as just to let everyone know, we did decide to hire an outsource, not even hire. They're a group of massive Akatar fans. They are our casting people, um, and they're going to be the ones making that call. So, because quite frankly, um, I will be so honest, looking at the comments and seeing everyone that is like, I want to audition for this character. I'm like, oh my God, I could totally see you as this character. I could see you as this character. I could see you as this character. And I'm like, I physically could not pick. I don't think I could. I know I couldn't. Yeah, I, I just can't believe this is actually happening. And I really am 
hoping that everything goes smoothly. Um, we are planning to launch auditions tomorrow. Um, and yeah, it's just I'm sweating really, just thinking about it. <laughs> it's really overwhelming. Um, we so do currently also have a second crowdfunding campaign for Wingspan Matters. Um, and we're still trying to promote that as well. So that's going to be going on for the next month or so. Um, Hi, Lady yeah. Joe, feel free to make a video if you want to. About uh, that. Yeah. Um, we would love it. Um, and, um, the importance of Wingspan. It matters. And, um, we're really just reaching out heavy, heavy. Yeah, heavy, oh, heavy to the community yeah. right now. Um, uh, also, you know, it is one of those things where um, – Without doing, you know, the official website, it is a lot more um, c- cumbersome, and also, it's going to be a so lot of it's going to be a lot of the community um, outreach and sharing, and um, you know, getting the word out so that we can get the best um, turnout possible uh, as far as auditions, since we won't have that on like a page where you know all other actors who are not really part of our following you know can see it so we're going to try to make the best effort to do that though to give everyone like a heads up of how it's going to work um so how it works is on the website we have links where you can audition for each character that you want to audition for please feel free to audition for as many as you want um and when you audition what you're going to do is you're going to send in you're not actually like acting yet we're not asking for like, unless you have a demo reel, feel free to attach it. We want to see a headshot. And then um, we're going to have you make a little 60 second video telling us why you want to be a part of it. And then at the very end, you're going to give a really fun um, one, your your favorite line from the character you're auditioning for. So um, from that- This is is for the main and supporting roles, by the way. The extras is working a little different. The extras are a little different. Val might be able to go into the extras roles um, after- that so how it's going to work so you're going to go you're going to audition you're going to click each link um for whatever character you want to audition for there uh again audition for as many as you want and then from there you're going to um attach your headshot um it's going to be from the neck up and then a body shot and then also the 60 second video just chatting with us about why you want to audition um or it's 90 seconds i think and then give us your favorite like quote from the character you're auditioning for and then um fill out all the things and then send it on in and then from there we're going to go and um weed through everything and then we'll send out emails or i think it'll be emails, yeah, we'll, yeah maybe emails for then callbacks and then that's when callbacks will happen and callbacks is where you will get the actual like side where you will be reading and then we're gonna probably do some chemistry tests um and stuff like that and chemistry reads um even if that has to be via zoom just to see you know the vibe of everybody and make sure you know cassian and nesta can bring that cassian and nesta feel um to the screen and then like Elaine and Azriel and Amarin and oh gosh I'm so excited <laughs> I'm excited I'm nervous I'm all the things yeah. so anyway that's just how it's gonna work um but uh, yeah, yeah so yeah so for the supporting roles and the main uh or the lead roles um that will be a callback process for extras if you guys just want to be extras in the film it is a similar form process however in this form um you will be given two different monologue choices and you will be uploading a monologue um, along with a 60 second uh, video saying why you want to be part of the project Um, and then from there um, it'll be a a thumbs up thumbs down and um, no callback process for extras and we will be assigning you um, where you're going to be which court you're going to be in Um, that is not you I think I don't think there's anywhere on there you can perform do a preference or anything like that we're basically going to kind of place people where we need them to be and um you could end up being hibern you could end up being spring sorry about that but uh somebody's <laughs> hey. got to do it right <laughs> and then um also i just want to put a disclaimer if for whatever reason you audition and you don't get picked i promise you it is not saying you are not good enough you are not worthy enough your cosplay isn't amazing because we aren't going off of um cosplays or anything like that this is going off of 
like straight acting ability yeah. and who our team of people think really bring that character to life the best. Yep. So it's nothing against you. It's nothing against anything like that. We still would love to have you as an extra um, and being a part of the day because we just want to have as many people from this community as well involved as possible because you are all the reason why this is even happening. So yeah. um, massive disclaimer because it's already so incredibly hard to like not have every single person. I'm like, so do we have five Elaines? Because um, – I guess we can have five different scenes with five different lanes in it (laughs) through the continuity because that's how my brain's going because it's so hard. (laughs) Um, So (laughs) Also, um, sorry, Hi Lady Joe. Literally, we're just going on this whole information. You're so fine. We're just (laughs) hanging out, but... <laughs> you're just getting like, exclusive information to everything. Get, I am you're literally so just in getting the know. The it is. I am so aware right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. So also, uh, just you know, whatever. Whoever is listening to this podcast right now, um, oh, and you want to go to audition. Idea. If anyone's having questions about um extras or uh cast casting. Um, we do put like disclaimers on there, but I would like to like maybe go into a little bit like the volunteer work part of it. So for hmm. extras, like that is a hundred percent volunteer. Um, yep. we, excuse me, <clears throat> that is a hundred percent volunteer. Um, we do our, we are not Hulu. Um, we are not a- uh, Amazon or any of these other big production companies. We are a tiny, tiny little whimsy gossip. We are putting all all of our crowdfunding and all of the money that we've raised into all of the essential elements of production. And that does not lend itself to pay, you know, the amount of extras and personnel that are going to be in this production. So we hope that people are okay with volunteer work. However, we will be having food and water provided to everyone on set. We will make sure that restrooms are available as well and um overall just making it a fun um playful atmosphere for everybody to kind of just have a good time um and then as far as the supporting roles and the lead roles we are giving a very 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 small small amount of compensation um this is also just due to the amount of crowdfunding that we raised it was not forty thousand dollars as you all probably can see um so we are not working with a, a large budget and so we are compensating where we can. Um, we are providing lodging where we can. And it'll be all hands on deck. If people are coming from out of town, hopefully we can coordinate with them, pick people up from the airport, you know, help them find their arrangements, things like that. But it's definitely going to be a lot of volunteer work. So we hope that everyone understands that and is okay with that and still wants it's to help. It's a fan film for the people by the people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes joe yes and <laughs> if you don't want to be in front of the camera and you're insanely talented at special effects makeup or makeup or being a boom operator or holding lights or gripping or anything like that again we'd love to have you send us an email let us know your expertise um and we will be more than happy to probably have you join us because again I'm a psycho and I just want as many people in the community um, as possible and we'll have obviously everyone um, in the credits. So my light is flickering and that was super scary. It's probably Ed, my ghost. So that's great. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think that that basically covers it. Um, <laughs> that covers it all. It, it Yeah, that covers it. So <sighs> Hi Lady Joe, take it away. Woo! Oh gosh. <laughs> so uh, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. So Joe, I know I've seen um your interest, it seems like on your uh cosplay page of getting into the more cinematic things and that stylistic stuff. What do you think um the community's perception to to our next fan film and this whole audition process is going to be? Like what do you think people's thoughts are right now out there in the community uh I think that the community um is like a lot of people are new to audition processes I think like there's a large amount of people um in the community that were like theater kids 
in high school um, and like college and stuff, but it's been like, mm. there's been a minute, you know? And so audition process are, processes are not always easy. You know, there's always, um, you know, you get a hundred no's before you get a yes sometimes, um, no matter what the audition is. Yeah. But chapter 54 was like such an iconic moment for the community. And I like really believe that Aqua Wars is really going to be another just like absolute staple. Um, just like You Do Not Yield was like so iconic. And so naturally, everybody's going to want to be involved and everybody oh. can be involved in a certain way, you know, or most people can be. Um, but I think in, as a community mm -hmm. as a whole, whether it's this fan film or like any other other audition that you're going for, just know like we all get told no, like that that happens to everybody, you know, it happens to me like I've been told no at a lot of auditions for various things. Um, but I think overall, like as a community, we're like moving in a more positive direction, the healthier mindset with the audition processes and everybody should just give it their best shot and root for the people that are going to be, you know, representing our community uh, in the fan in the film. So, and then can I, can I ask a question too? Yeah. Because no. you have been branching into more of like a cinematic side. What? <laughs> <laughs> Move it farther away, Tay, not closer. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm the worst. I get really excited and I want to talk into my mic. Um, so because <laughs> you have been branching into a more cinematic side lately, you're crushing the game, by the way. Um, lovely stuff. Um, anyway, with that, how do you, like, what inspired you? What, I guess, like with your Bryce content and everything, like just, I don't know, just like give us like some... I mean, I know you have a film background and I know you went to school with all that. And like, has this like book community and cosplay, did that kind of like awaken your school degree? Because yeah. like, is that like kind of, yeah, I don't like, know. How does it all tie in? I'm just, yeah, curious, no, for like, sure. So like I went to school for film and uh, emphasis in audio, but like I did all the filmmaking stuff, all like the like animation and things like that. And, um, I went, I worked one job in the creative industry after graduating and it really was just not for me. Like I, the environment was predominantly male and not very welcoming to me. And so, um, it made it really difficult. And so I went into more like office jobs that were not creative. And for like the last six years, I've just been like in this creative desert and if you are also a creative, you know, like how hard that is. Like I've had no outlet because in like normal people world, like there's nothing like this to like pour your soul into. <laughs> so I had had all these ideas of like films I wanted to make or documentaries I wanted to do, but I didn't really have like a place for it. And so I started doing TikTok just like, you know, you know, your normal, you know, chest to head, you know, lip sync videos. And I realized like, whoa, I could actually put some of my film training into this. And at the time I didn't, I didn't really have a lot of time to do that because it takes a lot of, you know, planning and then actually executing it to just do one video. Aubrey, uh, Hello Ness is like another person who does a lot of cinematic content. I mean, to get like two videos, it takes me like all day. So that's like a huge time commitment whenever I want to post two to three videos a day. So um, I was laid off yeah. in February. Not ideal, but <laughs> it did give me time to really dive into doing everything happens stuff. for a reason. Yeah, it really does. Uh, everything does happen for a reason. And it kind of felt like for a while, I kind of was towing the line of like, do I want to like really go all in on this? Do I want to like make a career out of cosplay? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I'm good enough to do that. I don't know. And then it, getting laid off was like the push I needed into, you know, m moving into a space where I could find a way to make a living and also do this thing I'm really, really passionate about. And so uh, that was kind of why I started doing more of the cinematic stuff. I just had more time and uh, – and more like of the resources. And it's been so creatively fulfilling that now I just 
feel like this huge like rush of creative energy like I'm just constantly new ideas popping up and I was like in a drought for so long so instead of following trends now I'm like really trying to focus on how can I make them and so that's where like the next year for me is headed yes yeah (laughs) I love that so much you've already been um we saw one trend that was going around with you for a while there, that audio you made. Oh, uh, yeah. Was <laughs> on that. Um, the cosplay one, yeah, that was good. That's amazing. That was good. Listen, I remember when Chapter 54 came out, I was full on panicked. I was panicked. And I saw on someone's – it wasn't our video on TikTok. It was someone else's video on TikTok. And they had wrote like a mean comment. And I reached out to Joe and I was just like, oh my gosh, like I'm freaking out. And they were like, oh, this just feels like cringy to me. And Joe's response is something that I have now taken to heart. And in your advice, I don't know if you remember what you told me, but you said, if they're cringing, it's because there is something inside of them that makes them uncomfortable. Like Mm -hmm. it's their uncomfortable. It's nothing on you. It's a them issue, not a you issue. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Joe. So now cringe is literally is- like an internal response to being like, wow, that person is like having like has joy and is like having fun. And I'm not allowed to do that inside of like the box that society has put me in. And now I'm uncomfortable because they're not in this box and they're supposed to be. And then it's like a real inner realization of like, I could be doing that. It's literally like the inner you holding yourself back from having fun Mm. that is because people don't cringe there's like a difference between cringing to something that's like bad and then cringing to something that's like joy and I really feel like cringe to joy is just like a shadowy part of yourself that like is like it's the adults in your life when you were little that told you to stop doing that because it's embarrassing that's that voice in you that's what cringe is Mm. (laughs) and so when people are like oh this is cringe I'm like wow, like someone when you were a child really like beat you down and didn't let you have fun at one point. And now you're like taking that out on other people who are indulging in their inner child because that's what a lot of cosplay is and and bookish stuff is. That's deep. I'm getting emotional. (laughs) That's why I took so much offense why I made made the audio because uh, I – I saw so many comments of people being like, this is why I'm afraid to cosplay. This is why I'm afraid to go to these events and dress up. And I'm like, that fear is the fear that some adult 20 years ago put into that person. And now they're commenting, they're regurgitating that back at you. And when what you really want to do is explore the mystery and the enchantment of childhood, because that's what it is. Like you're dressing up like a princess. Mm -hmm. You're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a princess. Well, now you can be one. And people are like, oh, that's cringe. Uh, that's just someone yeah. telling you that you're embarrassing oh them. Well, you know, that's – so to be cringe is to well, be that's free like just like because you're hate freeing on, like, yourself. Disney adults. Yeah, exactly. Like I can't tell you how many people have like been like, uh, ew, you're a Disney adult. Like you like to go to Disney like – why do you care like why are you so obsessed with disney and it's like because like i why like why grow up like why 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 can't adults also enjoy the joys that children get to enjoy like i I get so excited and giddy to meet gaston i get excited when i see the beast and bell on their their parade joy has no age the fireworks and the magic and the show yeah imagination has no age why why can't i have this joy (laughs) like yeah but people but we like as a society we've put an age on it like as a society we've put like a it into a box of like okay you can only feel this way until this age and this is acceptable and then once you pass that you have to be you know and then of course even like when you become a mom like a parent everyone's just like you put you in this box like you can only be this thing now that's acceptable and it's like why can't you still have your passions why can't you still have your joy and like you know what I mean there's just yeah well there's this like (laughs) there was this thing sorry to like I don't want to go on about it but all of that and (laughs) out there um there was this no this line going um (sighs) that 
when we were taught like Raven and I talk about this a lot because uh quote of the Raven and she and I are really good friends and uh, we're both moms and there's this like idea when you become a mother that you have to let your dream die and there was a moment even when I was a teenager when I wanted to be an actress when I grew up and that was kind of like TikTok is cosplay and TikTok has kind of been like a full circle moment for me in living out um my like childhood dreams of being an actress and so I let my dream die because I let someone in my life when I was 15 tell me that I would never do that and in that moment they killed my dream and I think often when we let our dreams die when we see other people living theirs it's a it feels offensive like well you get to do that I don't get to do that why do you get to do that but really the only thing holding you back is you like the there, Raven told me this really good quote that yes. like everything you've Amen. ever dreamed of is on the other side of being embarrassed, and so if you can push through that inner cringe and that em- embarrassment, like the things that you want are attainable. But that like the community that I've created is not unattainable to anyone. Like the f- the feeling that I get from cosplay is not unattainable to anyone. Anyone can do it. You just have to push past the feeling of I can't or I'm not good enough like anybody can that's the beautiful thing about it like I started with a couple t-shirts in my closet that yeah that's so that like makes me reminiscent Tay of like how when you finally posted publicly about whimsy gossip that feels like the same thing of like you know like Oh, I, when you told me like, I don't feel like I can post about this until it gets to this or until it's like this, because then at that point, it's like not embarrassing anymore. Right. Like, it's not like this thing that people are going to make fun of me for. If it's, if I have this amount of, you know, followers or if we're we're this, and if we're this big, then people can't attack us. Right. And I mean, they still do, but it's like, (laughs) it's that same idea of like getting over that fear of people laughing at you. And like, it's hard. Like, Oh, I really? think I literally said like it was like my Hannah Montana moment like I was pulling my wig off I just felt like <laughs> yeah because you know I had just gotten married my husband and I just bought a house and you know everyone's looking at us like so when are you having a baby <laughs> and it's like um lol this is my baby <laughs> Me gossip. This yeah. is what I do. <laughs> so um, it was a lot of like, I felt like pressure and expectation to just check the next box off instead of um, like fueling who I am. And um, it was so scary to put it out there. And then weirdly enough, um, a girl that I work with at work literally like two days ago sent me this video and was like, is this you or this is your twin? And it was like chapter 54. And she's like, I'm on TikTok. And I just started reading Akatar. And if it's not you, she's your twin. Wow. But this is really good. And I was like, that's me. And this is weird that you're seeing this. And then she <laughs> – then it just kind of spiraled into us like talking about Akatar for like an hour, which is really cool. But yeah. um, There's so many and people it's in like, my life that like randomly messaged me. I'm like – they're like, oh, Yeah. I listen to your podcast or like I saw your film or like, I think it's really cool what you're doing. And I'm like, I didn't even know you guys were paying attention. (laughs) Same. And it's almost like that, like kind of like you said, Joe and like Raven's advice, like it's on the other side of embarrassment, like starting a podcast, it's kind of crazy. But then again, I think back to a little over a year ago, I didn't know you. I didn't know Jen. I didn't know Kate. I didn't know Aubrey. I didn't know Raven. I didn't know Summer or Grayson or Connor or any of anyone, yeah. any of these people who I hold so deeply in my heart right now that like there's even more on that list that I would just go to war for. Like I would, I can't imagine. Leslie. And I know we were Leslie. Oh my gosh. Olivia. Like I could like just sit here and I could just boop, boop, boop. Mm-hmm. Megan. Like, I mean, I, we, we talked about this, um, in like a group chat that we have that like I am a little sad I'm already married because these are all the people I would have at my yeah. wedding and like these are people that I would want at my my important day so like if I I just can't imagine my life without any of them anymore um or anyone anymore yeah. and it's like if you it's could be cringy yes but like 
only to the people who don't see the beauty in it yeah. and don't see I, how special it is. My message now, so, like whether yeah. it's cosplay or no matter what it is in your life where you're like wanting to take a leap and you're like, I just don't know. Just do it. Like, like I, especially with meeting people, with making friends, with like joining any community, yeah. like whatever it is that you're into – for me, it's like whether it's cosplay or you want to start like a flat, like a, a, a book talk or bookstagram with just flat lace or whatever a part of this community that you're in, it's worth it. Like it's worth overcoming that part of yourself that is holding you back because there's nothing but joy on the other end of it. Like I was so lonely and mm-hmm. just, I felt like it. nobody on the planet understood me. I had literally, I had no friends like a year ago. And now I, I'm surround like I am like I have surrounded by people all the time. Like if I need someone, I can call, pick up my phone and call twenty different people. I have like not no exaggeration. I've never had that ever in my life. Had friends like I've made, but I these friends are different because I'm truly myself. The friends I've had in the past, I was never able to like overcome that inner part of myself. I think that's why friendships in this community are so deep because it's like I had to overcome like the hurdle of the mask I put on for other people and like you guys see me as I truly am unadulterated like no filter and that's kind of going back to what we were talking about before we started recording the no filter thing like you guys truly see me with zero filter zero mask and I've never felt I, I was so scared for so long that if I showed everyone the things I truly loved and who I truly was that no one would get it but what I found was that when I did that and when I di- when I really dived in head first into this community with my creativity and my artistry, all I found was like just so much love, and love from others and love for myself and seeing my value, um, and what I bring. Like I never had that before. So to bring it back to the film thing, that's I mean and I never had your that, creativity. So. <laughs> I love that. Well, the creativity side that you were just speaking on, you and Sass just created this epic Elaine and Tamlin video <laughs> that the chaos. just fueled my um my the, the chaos, it fueled my chaos, and it also fueled so... the Tamlin and Elaine are end game. <sighs> yeah. I appreciate that con- like this that video so much as a contribution <laughs> to Tamlin's like redemption in the community. Like I feel like that video is going to make people like just start to change their minds. Like all we have to do is plant little seeds in preparation yeah, the, for the comments have been really grow, overwhelmingly like positive, which really surprised me because when Saski and I posted it this morning, yeah, she- we were like, this yeah. get- might get bad. <laughs> did it we were like this is either gonna go really well or really poorly <laughs> but actually everyone's been really awesome on it and um I've seen a well, lot of comments being like well maybe it's not so bad I'm like the tide's turning <laughs> the tide is turning <laughs> this time last year it was such a toxic place to be a pro Tamlin person like it was yeah, oh so gosh. bad I feel like just over this past year People are starting to like open up more towards him. Mm-hmm. And so our first ever episode on our podcast was we love Resand, but we don't hate Tamlin. And it was our whole thing on why we think Tamlin deserved a redemption arc. Let mm-hmm. me tell you the worst audio ever, but worst. one of our highly like highest, most listened to episodes. Top three. I think even over it's number three. Yeah. Like we had all this fourth wing content come out and still like everyone is all like, why the heck do you like Tamlin? And um the coolest yeah. part is when we have people message well, us know, like i listen to your channel things don't have to be so mutually exclusive it. like, and it's just like we're like yes yeah, he's not the worst man yeah. in the world like we love reese but tamlin's not like the worst Woo! <laughs> yes. yeah all right guys <sighs> crescent city three let's get into three. that <laughs> let's get into this all right so um yes. So we start off Crescent City Part 3 with Sunball, Captain Ethan, and Hypaxia now making their way to Avalon to find Sophie's body to save Sigrid because Ethan will not, for the life of him, give up on this girl. Makes no sense. Um, but basically, you know, we left off with Sigrid choosing to be a Reaper 
and Jessica basically being like, so, and Hypaxia being like, so you got, we need Sophie's body because that's the only way we can possibly bring Sigrid back to life and save her from being a reaper. Um, this felt like a way to just get them to a Valen. I don't know. Like, it was really weird. I feel like this part where Ethan and Hypaxia are on this, like, journey to a Valen during all of this, mind you, of, like, Bryce being missing and he doesn't know if Rune and Hunt and all them are rescued yet. And, like, they're just like, we're just going to take a trip on a boat to a Valen and go find Sophie Renasse's body. Somehow, maybe we'll convince the freaking Avalon King to give us her body so we can resurrect Sigrid so that she can be the prime so that I don't have to. It was just a lot of avoiding responsibility. Like Sunball Captain Ethan is he's a trip. He's and I just don't I, I still will never understand the importance of freaking Sigrid. I don't understand. And that was like probably the one like missed opportunity storyline throughout cc3 where i was like what the hell is going on <laughs> the entire time but i'm really trying to trust the process that in house of um many waters that things are gonna come full circle with that whole storyline because it felt like why did you introduce this character kill her bring her back kill her again like it was just like a <laughs> lot like that whole storyline was just a lot <laughs> And I did feel bad. Like, I know it's, yeah. like, I don't understand his logic throughout the entire book. But, like, Ethan, through pretty much almost the end, is, like, on his own little island the entire time. Like, he has, like, no direction from anybody. <laughs> he's, like, his whole life, he's just been yeah. told what to do all the time. Yeah. And now he's, like, trying to figure out how to, like, basically be, a like, a king in a way. Like, he's like, running his own thing. And it's very stressful. Reading the reading Ethan's parts was like yeah. my mom hi, my mom anxiety was heightened. I was like, oh my God, you need someone to like help you. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. what is stop. I don't understand Ethan at all. Literally. Like, just, just stop. Just like relax, bro. Like we're like I don't but know. But I will say Ethan and Jessica is the duo I didn't know I needed, but I love. Yeah. So. Yeah. I did I, love Well, Jessica's the first person in a long time to actually be so, like, Ethan, yeah. this is what to do. Like, everybody else would be like, I don't know, what do you want to do? Whatever you want to do. And Jessica's the first person, like, pack this stuff, put it on the shelves. And Ethan's like, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he needs that. I feel like he's yeah. the type of person who needs that level of direction. Like, he because he clearly has no sense of it for himself. <laughs> and then Hypaxia is just like along for the ride. It's like really random, to be honest with you. Like she's just like, okay, like I'm I would love a bonus chapter, you. like on her story and how she got like yeah. overthrown. I know. Like I would love a bonus chapter on that. So then we cut to Bryce and Hunt on a Valen, and it's now growing back into this beautiful island. And she, we find out that her mom, dad, Fury, and June are all now somehow going to get into a helicopter and helicopter over to this <laughs> island. Um, and, like, okay, that's great for them. And then um, Bryce and uh, Hunt, they're talking, and they're all like, we're going to do this big reveal to the media about how the Asteri and their lies like how they're lying about everything and play the clip of her killing Micah. And she's like, Oh, we need to get like in touch with Jessica to get this video. And they come up with this whole plan. Um, and so in the midst of all that, then Ethan and Hypaxia arrive and Ethan is just venting about how he needs Sophie's body. Like right off the bat, he's just like, I need Sophie. I did a bad thing. I killed, I killed her. <laughs> And Bryce is like, um, we have like way bigger things going on right now than this. And also Sophie's body is probably underneath like all this rubble that got destroyed. So we find out that Ethan and Hypaxia's journey is basically for nothing. The only reason for it is to kind of move the plot along, I feel like. Basically for them to tell mm -hmm. them that Asphal, Asphodel Meadows got attacked and for Bryce to be like, look, Hypaxia there's the thing called a parasite and uh, we need you to figure it out. Okay. <clears throat> so essentially 
I feel like they were just brought to a Valen to tell Bryce about Asphodel Meadows being bombed and for Bryce to be like, look, Hypaxia, listen, there's a parasite. All right. And we need you to find a cure because you know how to do stuff. So, you know, now Ethan and Hypaxia have a new mission. And basically it's just like, Ethan's just like, I still want to figure out how to save Sigrid. But now we have a more important mission, which is to find a cure for the parasite in the water. Um, so, yeah. So I put Ethan Hypaxia have a new mission. Make a, make a cure for the parasite. Dun, dun, dun. Um, so how do we feel about this whole thing so with Hypaxia like, and Ethan and this like, journey? Like... And then they have to go all the way back. I felt like really the story like parallels for me where like Bryce is having to get like more and more like hardened throughout the story. Like she's having to shut down a lot of her like human empathy in order to like get done what needs to be done. And Ethan is like on like a parallel path where he's like giving in to like this empathy for Sigrid like the entire book. And it's, like, getting in the way. And so it's, like, on one hand, Bryce is, like, so Mm. cold and calculated. And she's – everyone's, like, you're just like your dad. You're just like your dad. And she's kind of giving in to that a little bit more of, like, her fey heritage. And and she's really a lot like Aelin in this book where she's, like, I have to get things done. I cannot – I don't have time or the space to feel things. And then the Asphodel Meadows moment – is like a shift for both of them where Bryce is like feeling again and the pain of like that loss hits her. And then on the opposite side, it's a wake up call for Ethan to start shutting that down a little bit so that he can get things done. Like they kind of have Mm. this like switch of like Ethan's Mm. giving in way too much. Bryce isn't giving in enough and Asphodel Meadows for both of them because that's their personal connection to each other was Asphodel Meadows in the first book. Uh, where Bryce and Ethan save Asphodel Meadows together. So the fact that that moment is kind of, again, like their connection and their like switching, you know, and kind of like it's for them both a parallel moment. But the the journey to get there is like so asinine. (laughs) 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 It is. It really is. is because like then like Hypaxia... And Ethan, get back there. It it feels, like, so quick. Like, honestly, as I'm looking through the pages, it's, like, all of a sudden now how they're back in, you know, Crescent City or in Lunathion and um, Hypaxia. And Ethan start working on the cure. And Hypaxia asks um, Ethan for a Reaper. And Ethan finds one. And then Hypaxia is able to get a sample from him. And I know that this Reaper, like, really had a big effect on you, Tay. Um, You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it really bothered me, the idea of a Reaper, and I don't know why. What The Bone Quarter and then Reapers just really stuck with my soul mm. um, because we see this guy coming in with, like, this cocky bravado. And when he leaves, Ethan kind of gives, like, this attitude, like, wow, he was, like, so full of himself. And Hypaxia was like, no, he's not. Like, do you not realize, like, he is clinging to whatever mortal life he has left? And that's what reapers are. They are just their unsettled souls. They don't feel like they had their their time was cut short here, that they're willing to come back to live like this half life. Because that's really what it is, like a half of a life, like not even a full life. And um, it just really made me like so sad. And my heart just like broke for them. Just the thought of like they're coming back and you're able to come back, but you're not able to come back as like your full self. You're only able to come back is like this half version, this half life. You'll only ever feel half the joy, half, I mean, maybe more sadness. I don't imagine, but like imagine just not being able to feel. It just, it made me so sad for Reapers and the idea of what they actually are um, and how I do feel like some people live like a Reaper they're too safe and they don't explore if we want to go into what we were saying about earlier on the other side of embarrassment but like you could live as a reaper and you could be living this half life and then when it comes your time and you're not ready 
you know, you feel like your life is like unfulfilled, yeah. uncompleted because you had so many regrets. Bryce does that in the first book. So it's like her yeah, whole they just thing. really, really upset me. Like Bryce is basically like puts on this bravado. Yeah. Like he, she, everybody thinks she's like this party girl and she's not. She like lets everyone think that she's brave and she's unaffected and she's cold, but really she's not at all. And she lives a half life without Danica and like Crescent city is really just like mm-hmm. one big book about mortality and how the impression that we leave on people when we go. Yeah. And that the reapers are like that. It's like, you can, you, there are things worse than dying. Like they're not living your life is worse than dying. Mm-hmm. That's like what the reapers are really a hundred percent about. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Yeah. Book. The reaper really bothered me. The scene really, really bothered me. So um, yeah. it stuck with me for a bit. I was like, oh. So wh- then so, they make the cure in like two point five. <laughs> they make the cure in two point five seconds. <laughs> so, Joe, how did you feel about like literally right after this? Like, I have that's the next like note that I have is like the cure was made in like two chapters, and then Ethan takes well, it, it and gets his full powers back. Um, and Hypaxia is, Hypaxia is just like, so why don't you just lead the wolves? How do we feel? How do you feel, Joe, about this entire exchange between Hypaxia and Ethan and their little journey up to this point? So, like, I had just read, which I actually recommend this. If you ever do a reread of CC3, read Tower of Dawn, like, right before you read it. Really cool stuff from the beginning of CC that will blow your mind if you've just finished the end of Tower of Dawn. Um, But at the end, so I had just gone through this whole Irene Towers thing where Irene's magic hands just fix everything. So I was like seeing all these parallels between (laughs) between, uh, both Lydia and Hypaxia and then the witches and healers uh, in Tower of Dawn. And so I was like, I think I was just so fine with like this whole thing with Irene just being like, and I could just, and I can just kill a Volk King. Like, I think I was just so okay with that, that I was like, oh, well, I mean, that's fine. Like, that's fine, I guess. Um, but then like thinking back on it, I was like, that was a little too easy. Uh, but I think Hypaxia, I, I'm kind of disappointed. This is like my biggest critique of the book, honestly, is I was really disappointed in Hypaxia's character arc. Because I really wanted more from her. And it felt like after the ball scene in CC2, she kind of just like falls off the face of the earth and she's like not really helpful again. And like every time she tries to be helpful, it's just a disaster. And um, so it was interesting to me that she ends up through that whole scene and like the few scenes that follow in the bone quarter being like the most helpful character like thus far in the book like it it really kind of like was like a huge 180 for her and i i didn't necessarily love that like hypaxia is the first person and and jessica are like these first people that have even suggested to ethan that he be that he take over like i i didn't love that i'm like you don't hardly even know him like i i would have loved if that was a conversation from like rune or hunt or bryce you know, or even like Declan, yeah, like so guys that like, to him. yeah, I, I thought it was a little, know him. Yeah. It was weird. Out of It place. was a little weird. Like I didn't love it. And I, I didn't love a lot of the stuff that Hypaxia talks about at that point with like, I made this cure, but it's really unstable. Like it ends up being basically irrelevant. <laughs> so <laughs> like, I, yes. I didn't love that. And not needed. Right. Yeah. So that's the biggest critique. Like one of the bigger, bigger critiques is how so like how quickly this was created. I mean, yeah. it was literally like seemed like it was it was talked about as this, this whole really difficult thing, or it was going to be so hard to find. You know, people have studied the water for years. It's going to be hard to, and then she found the delineation just like that. Mm-hmm. And you know, why do you, do you think that this was just um, like Sarah didn't have the time? to really play this out like what do you think this whole cure thing really was for sarah i want to believe that we're gonna know more by the end of the fourth book like for okay for this is a good maybe a good parallel in akawar nesta and elaine 
they're able to just like find the cauldron. We spend the whole book, like, where's the cauldron? Where are the pieces of the cauldron? We can't find Highburn and like Akamath's, where's the book? We got to find the book. We got to put it together. And Nesta and Elaine can just find it. And so I don't know if this is going to be one of those moments Mm -hmm. where by the end of Silver Flames, we know everything about Nesta and everything makes sense. Maybe by the end of House of Many Waters, Hypoxia's ability to just whip out a cure like that is going to make more sense. I'm like, it's hard for me to judge. Because at least with the cauldron, it was a little bit more explained, though, like, because they were made from it. Like, it made, I don't know. I don't feel like it was as cheesy as, like, this was. Yeah, this felt very, you know, it, it feels like in these books, like, it's very clear that Sarah loves Bryce. She loves Hunt. She loves Rune and Lydia. And it kind of feels like she's got this huge cast of characters. And what's happening to Hypoxia, to me, feels like what's happened to um, Lysandra. Where Lysandra kind of became like this background Mm. character where every time that there was a big problem and she didn't know how to solve it, Lysandra would just turn into a giant sea dragon and take care of everything. And that's kind of felt like... I felt like Hypoxia now is like, well, I'll just make a cure. I'll just become the king of the bone quarter. Like that's kind of, <laughs> she's like the Lysandra now of CC, which makes me sad. Like I want more Hypoxia. <laughs> I think I, she's so cool. And that makes me, wow. My brain is like. <laughs> yeah. It like wow, it breaks my Joe. heart. Wow. I, I don't yeah. think we can have in-depth to the very bottom of your drop and back up in-depth character analyses of every single character in the series. Like we couldn't have that in Throne of Glass. And I think that Sarah is making a statement with Crescent City 3 because like there's a lot going on. I think that she's making a statement of like, this is how my books are going to be written. It's going to be large cast of characters. It's going to be a lot of point of views, just like Silver Flames. It's going to be a lot of characters now going on. So deal with it. And that's fine. But that means that like, whereas in Aka War, Aka Math, Akatar, we got to like dive into the depths of every single character and all their nuances. That's just not going to happen. Like, that's why I Rowan, felt about Throne of Glass. I felt like Throne of Glass. We got to dive. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's the same thing. Like a lot of people. Hunt and Rowan are very similar. For Like you can't dive into the deep depths of of the of these characters because there's not enough there's not enough room on the page and that's just yeah that's just how it is well not for just three and books, i think hypoxia you know, is an unfortunate like... victim i think that sjm played herself by making this a four book series i think what she did is she finished silver flames well she finished aqua war and then she was like man i miss throne of glass so she's like i'll just write throne of glass what if i did throne of glass in new york city and so she wrote Throne of Glass in New York City, but she said, well, that was really long and that took me a really long time to write. So I'll make it really short. But SJM, babe, you can't even make Akatar her books, let alone an epic high fantasy set in a city the size of New York. That's not going to happen. So I think that yeah. she's announced I to Twilight of the eight, Gods yes. because I don't think that I don't think that she can finish the story she wants to tell with these characters in four books and twilight is dusk. So I think that we're just going to have more of these characters uh, in a different, you know, Bryce can open the portals. She'll open them again. That's kind of my theory. Oh my gosh. That's really interesting that you talk about it that way, because I feel like, I feel like Crescent City, this whole drawn out battle should have been like at least a few more books. Yeah. Like, I don't feel like it should have wrapped up this early. I think that's Um, why I'm like suspicious. (laughs) I'm like, imagine that you like, imagine if you killed Amarantha at like the beginning of Avatar. You'd be like, there's something else afoot. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, there's something else. Like, yeah. if they killed Highburn at the end of the first book, you'd be like, well, then who's the big bad guy? Uh, so well, that's why I'm like confused. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, SJM is really I don't good. I want them to be, I don't like that they're defeated. 
Yeah, no, and I don't think they are because I think- How do you get worse? How do you get worse than intergalactic parasites? Well, Who have like taken down so many worlds, except for like two worlds that fought back. So so like, not to jump all the way to the end, but um, you know, Bryce's entire- You know, once like they start- once like Ethan, like him and and Rune and Therian are like we're gonna get the antidote to everybody, you know. From that point on, it's reminding me the antidote of, that goes nowhere. Yeah, it's reminding me of um when they're like Aelin is in the lock and banishes the gods. She's like, I killed the gods. Uh, girl, no, you didn't. You threw them through a door. There's a difference. So I'm feeling a lot. I thought she of, went like, through it and like burned them all. Maybe. I, my rule with SJM. I think she set it books, on fire, didn't she? Yeah, she she did. She set it on fire. Yeah. My whole but she didn't kill them. We don't know. They could be alive. Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> my thing with SJM books is if I don't see you get your head chopped off, you're not dead. Like you are not dead to me. There is no way because fair, fair. people be coming back. Fair. And even then there's a theory mm-hmm. about in, you know, the antechamber underneath the prison, the, the Asteri that we meet in Prithian is like, there are a lot of people that have said that that sounds and seems like Maeve. And so if you are some kind of being that can possess bodies, you're non-corporeal. You know, we think that cutting your head off kills you, but does it just cut off access to that body? And like what, you know, maybe she killed that form of the gods, but do we know that like they can't take another form and escape? You know, like what even are the gods? If the gods are all dead, how does the world keep going? Like there's a lot to like her religious and magic system that hasn't been like fully explained so to me, I'm like, is throwing. Yeah, I want nothing the more than Rigelis corp- to come back to life. Yeah. If if she like throws the Asteri into a portal and she's like, bye, is that enough to kill whatever is in them? Like, we don't, we know it's a parasite, but like, what does that even mean? Where did they even go? You know, I don't know. Do you remember just, when, um, what's his name? Uh, Aelin killed or. Who is the, it's um in what's it called in Throne of Glass, the not Maeve. What's the other guy's name? The King Erwan. She killed the not king. the King. Yeah. Um, Erwan. Erwan. When he died, he was like this gross-looking, nasty thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like the grossness yeah. from the inside ate him out, and I wonder if that's like the parasite. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's got to be something that can move in a way that is not physical because they put the stones on people and then somehow that being mm. is able to transport through the, through the, basically a gate through the collar into that body. But like what is coming through that mini gate? If like a wordstone collar is basically a gate around your neck. Like, what, where are they able, like, where mm-hmm. are they coming from and how are they able to enter into your body, you know, or through a ring? Like, it's a circle. Do it's you think that gate. the Vogue and the Asteri are the same thing? Oh, 100%. Without a doubt. Yeah. You So you don't think the Asteri are gods? You think they're Vogue? No. I think the gods, I think they're all the same thing. I think it's just the same, same thing, different outside. I think it's like wolf in sheep's clothing. So like Mala Firebringer is a Volg? Well, I I think that Maeve kind of hints at it where she's like not all Volg are bad. You know, there's like mm. – and, and even the Volg had wars on their own planet. So we can assume if Erewhon is fighting against – beings on his own planet that they're 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 probably good beings because Erewhon is evil like he wouldn't fight against other like they're probably some force of good and evil and Maeve seems to have some level of a conscience yeah. even if she betrays it yeah. at times she's able capable of some level of compassion for her people so it's she's not great but she's not like pure unadulterated <laughs> evil like Erewhon so 
uh, I think that like there's more to it. And I think Twilight of the Gods is where we're going to get more of it. But I think CC3 is like the first clearest picture we have of how deep this goes. Because in Tower of Dawn, underneath the uh, Toric Chesme, Toric Chesme, there are sarcophagi that are sealed and there's images of Fae. And so they assume that the um, Fae must have sealed themselves in so they couldn't be taken over by the Vogue. But then when I read in the beginning of CC of this Vogue Asteri that has been sealed inside of a tomb, I'm like, hmm, that sounds like a dozen, two dozen, three dozen of those underneath the Tor Chesme in Tower of Dawn, which is not a great thing because they did not deal with that in this series. <laughs> so that's why I'm like, when they're talking about in CC3, Joe. Bryce is yeeting them into a black hole i'm like that's oh. probably not great <laughs> probably not great <laughs> so i don't think bryce's story is over why would she keep the god slayer rifle and we have we know we have a series coming up called twilight Fuck. of the gods the dusk of the gods and literally <laughs> sarah said she misses writing about the witches and dorian and yeah. she misses She's oh my! I have chills all over my body. She said she just I'm wrote a book for my friends, or she's I'm writing so a book worried for my friends. That um, she said was really emotional for her to write. My theory is we're gonna see an Aelin, a Manon, a, a Rowan, but we won't see a Dorian. We won't see uh in in a lead or an Irene or a Kale. I think time will have passed. Or a Lorcan and they'll have... he tied his body, yeah. his his life with a lead. I have chills all over my body. I'm really emotional. Yeah. <laughs> Dorian's the only person that matters. Uh, but the fact she that brings we have back Irene Dorian, if who... she brings back Dorian, I Dorian's well, a human so Val. Dorian has a lot of so I read so, Kingdom of Ash right after CC3 and my mind was just continuously blown because it's like well the only way we can contain oh my gosh we can contain this evil is with a lock the only way that they can contain the Asteri is in a tomb so they have to be locked away Bryce does not lock them mm -hmm. away she doesn't she doesn't create a dread trove item uh you could say maybe that the bullet Connor makes is a dread trove item she doesn't create a dread trove item to lock them away, which is basically but that what hit Aitlin the first does. light, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. but like, are you? Yeah. Is Bryce capable of creating a dread trove item? I mean, maybe she is one, but Aelin is. Aelin has a has a mark as well. I think yeah. she's starborn, um, and I think that we're going to see them. I think all, so see Reese. some of them at least again. I think what we're going to see is Irene will have trained some healers and they're going to have a massive problem with these, with the Volg underneath. And it's interesting to me that you've got Volg, potentially a Steri Volg, all the same thing, entombed underneath the place where on, the only people in the world that would be able to contain them, the healers, are literally like almost protecting this yeah. tomb of Asteri and we the only healer that we know of in the CC world is like going to be Hypaxia and her people and she's obviously able to come up with a cure so back to all of that to say Tower of Dawn reading it right before CC3 and then Kingdom <laughs> of Ash right after was mind-blowing because I was like wow wait Hypaxia is just a healer from the tour that is literally what's happening She's just creating basically, she's basically creating, taking Irene's ability to like blast them with her light and creating like, you know, some kind of potion that can do what Irene did. Yeah. That's insane. And like kill it. Yeah. Wow. My wow. mind is blown and I'm wow. literally terrified for what I thought was a completed series that apparently not is not completely no after reading cc3 and then reading kingdom of ash i'm like this Ooh. story is far from over same with silver flames that story is far from over nesta's story is not done um uh, and mm -hmm. which i'm excited clearly see you can clearly see like how much love she has for nesta yeah. putting her in such a position as she did in cc3 she clearly is not done and no. like really loves nesta a lot yeah 
And also I had noticed like what was really cool for me was seeing like when she did give those little nods to the other fae that are more elemental fae with the like fangs mm-hmm. and the ears and you know that's their magic is more elemental. Immediately it was like that is Throne of Glass and the stag and the whole fact that Lydia is a deer shifter and then fire is how she appears. I am literally like Lydia and Aelin. Are and her same. son is named Bran. Yeah. And I'm just over here like this is this is the crossover that I, I just want Aelin. I I love our friends from Akatar and having them in this. I just actually want all of them to come back in one book. Mm-hmm. I just need a book of literally all three that we all thought we were going to get. That's what we all wanted. That's what we all wanted. And that's what I all, that's what I need. And if that's what Twilight of the Gods is going to be, then I'm ready. I am ready open arms Havlier. ready. I, I really feel like that's going to be Havlier. the mic drop either at the end of Akatar 6 or the end of CC4 before we get Twilight of the Gods is going to be this moment where it's like Bryce has contained Asteri. You know, Nesta and Elaine have killed Volg potentially with Highburn. That's a whole other theory. But we've never killed a god. Uh, and then Aelin's going to be like, I have. And that's, I, I think that they're going to have to. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it, Nesta's eyes glow. Aelin has the mark that glows and Bryce has the star that glows. And I think that those three together will really like have, they're going to have to, you know, how do something. How does she even have it's all this like, in her head? It's like, like with how does a- this woman do it? I, she says she doesn't write anything down. And that to me is, I'm like, you're either lying or you're a psycho and I love you for it. <laughs> I guess one of the two. <laughs> That's so crazy. So we, so then we have this whole thing after that where Bryce Hunt and her mom and her dad decide to go journey to the Northern Rift to open it. Um, and there's this whole thing there where she ends up opening a portal, but she opens a portal to Prithian. And this is where the whole like Reese is coming Reese is coming. It's like jokes and memes start happening with his big cloud of freaking dark whatever because I don't understand it. Um. Anyway, but she basically is like, um, take my parents. I need the mask. Nesta's like, what? And then ends up saying yes. Bryce gets the mask from Nesta. And then the harpy appears. Celestina appears. There's a whole thing. Bryce is instantly able to wield the mask, which is like really crazy and <laughs> They have this whole battle up there in the Northern Rift. So, like, let's talk about that. Oh, my God. I, like, I... <laughs> the Harpy freaked me out. I was, I'll say that off the Yeah. Bat. The Harpy really freaked mm-hmm. me out. Uh, I did not like that at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> resurrected so and all that. Nope. Hiding were you guys in the shocked about snow? Nesta? Were you guys shocked about Prithian and Nesta? And were you hoping that, like... This was the moment where they were going to come through. And I was hoping out. Nesta was going to wield the mask. I was hoping she was going to be like, I was hoping like, Nesta would You jump know through. what? Don't trust you. Yeah, don't trust you. How about I wield it? And then, like, let me I help you I think that it was, a, it was, like, a pivotal moment for Nesta, though, because, like, she's clearly still having problems with Reese, even though she literally mm-hmm. saved his life and his mate's life and his baby's life. I've got beef with Reese and right now. Like, big time. And it's, like, the – it's the Cards Against Prithian card where it's, like, Reese is an asshole when written from anyone's perspective except for Feyre. (laughs) It's literally that. It's so frustrating. Yeah. And I was so angry at, like, this misogynistic need to control Nesta. Like, she's not – literally – she says over and over again, I'm not a member of your court. Like, I'm something else. And – She's clearly going through it. She's lost her like mating mark, her tattoo thing with Cassie, and that's gone. What what's that about? Wait, like what? I want to know. She, yeah, her tattoo on her back is gone. Wait, what? Yeah, why? Yeah. She says what? my. So oh, at the same time God. that the rifts are opened and Hell comes into CC in CC two. Nesta's tattoo disappears. 
And she talks about that in CC3. She's like, my tattoo, I had this eight pointed star tattoo and it's gone. And that was at the same time that this, that the star appears on Bryce. So that is the mark that she gets on her back whenever she makes the deal with Cassian, the bargain with Cassian. And now that's gone. Cassian's acting really weird. Reese is acting really weird. We do not know what's happened in the last six months since Silver Flames ended. And she's being treated like a prisoner again. What is going on? And so oh God, Taylor's not going to be okay right now. Taylor is something not okay. is going <laughs> on with Nesta. And so she obviously can't leave. Asriel is the one who is able to calm her down and is the one who's with her, not Cassian. That's weird to me. Uh, why are they sending her on secret missions with Asriel, not I'm her like mate? I'm full of tears right now. Wait a minute. That is so – wait a minute. Wait a yeah. damn minute. I didn't even so think about she, that. She can't even leave. Think, why is Cassian not with her? Yeah. She can't leave. She's – She's something is keeping her there, but she knows she can trust Bryce. So she gives her the mask. I, I think that Bryce is able to wield the mask with no problem because she is a dread trove item. Whereas Nesta can make them like she is made. Bryce is made in a similar way to how Nesta is made. When you think about it, Danica basically makes, well, she put it in her back. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, she is the horn. She is a dread trove item. So she's probably, like, the closest thing, even closer than Nesta, maybe other than Aelin, because Aelin becomes the lock. I think that, like, she is the lock. She is a dread trove item in the same way that Bryce is. So I think she's able to command it just because of that. Also, Bryce has um, given up her soul. So that's a little different. Like if that's right. the, if the mask can like take your soul, if Bryce has given it up at that point, then you know, maybe that makes it easier for her. But uh I did so I am unwell. I, I am yeah, unwell. I really I'm still stuck on this whole Cassie. I don't know how I missed <laughs> this. But let me tell you the Why tears did we are not there. think about this? I'm not okay. I just thought we were having a Nesta Azrael buddy moment, like Favor and Cassian, like drunkenly decorating the house for Christmas. Um, no, I... Azrael is like, think about your nephew. He's not like, think about Cassian. That- Wait a minute. And also, Al- um, Taylor, remember how everyone, and I was not talking to you about this, everyone was giving uh, Cassian so much shit because he wasn't sticking up for Nesta, like while Reese was giving her shit. What's that all about? Yeah, that's what I'm. He's acting. Totally that's another. Different. That's another thing. He would have never stood for that after everything she's been through in Silver Flames. She gave up everything, but then that bargain was made. Like all of that happens. She gives up her power. She makes this bargain with Cassian. The mark. All of that happens within a span of like thirty minutes, and then it's just gone. And now she's got all her power back. She can use all the Dread Trove items. And she's basically sent into the sewer to deal with a problem. And Amarin doesn't want her to, which Amarin sus through the whole book. Reese doesn't want her to deal with yeah. it. And they're just I think like, Reese deal knows with, more like, than he's letting on. They, they all do. But like, Reese Nesta, definitely knows more. Nesta's basically been put back at the bottom of the freaking food chain. And it's clear to me that the reason is because Reese is afraid of her. And I, I honestly want her to be High Queen of Prithian so bad. I think she's the only oh being gosh. that is stronger than Rhysand. And I think he's scared of her realizing that. Um, yeah. And I loved... I'm just going to cry because her, Nesta and Cassian, and Cassian are my, my are, babies. Do you, you think they're not mates anymore? No, I think they're mates. I just think that... I do think that Cassian's going to die. I don't think that he's going to... I don't think he's going to make it to the end. Uh, but I think like, that, what is the, why do you think he's acting different though? I think that he either, either Nesta's pregnant, which will make me very mad, honestly. Um, or because that's the only reason I can think of, of him being so weird or Feyre's pregnant again. And that's why he's being so I think there's some kind of weird family dynamic that's happening because Cassian stands up to Resand 
Asriel does too. They do all the time. And now it's your mate. And you're yeah. newly mated. They're like six months mated. I so know he doesn't stand up for her. You know, he doesn't stand up for her at all. So I'm like, either you're not mates, but that's probably not happened because he's like, she's like, this is my mate. Um, I, I have my suspicions and I just feel, I, I know a lot of people want the next Akatar book to be an Elaine book. And I do think it will be an Elaine book, but it's not going to be just Elaine. I think we're going to see this writing style of SJMs just become her norm where she's got like two or three storylines going on at the same time. She kind of did that in Silver Flames with Cassian and Nesta each having their own POV. But I think we're going to see a lot more of that going forward where I think the next book, my prediction is we're going to see like Nesta thing. I'm, I think that she's going to be resand is going to have, he's on his knees thanking her like, Oh my God, you saved my life. You saved my mate. You saved my baby. You literally just prevented the worst possible thing that could happen. And after all the dust settles on that, Amarin, sneaky little snake, will have been like, she literally is more powerful than all of us combined because I can't save your ass anymore. Mm -hmm. So maybe you need to think about that and deal with that. I think she's stuck in the house of wind. Bored in the house, in the house bored. And um, I think... (laughs) I think she's going to be, I think she's going (laughs) to have, you know, Bryce get, trusts her with her parents. And I think that that whole bonus chapter of her with Ember is like her giving up her complacency because what I saw of Nesta in the beginning of CC3 and then when we see her again from Ember's perspective is someone who has given up again. She's just given up again. She's like all the strength of Nesta at the end of Silver Flames. This like she's out of her shell. She's like shut down again. And so I want to see her now take the sword and the knife and Asriel and her Valkyries and be like and go on her own journey of of decimating because you know that there's more than just one Vogue. Yeah. Or one Asteri in a coffin underneath the prison and that's it. Highly doubt it. So I want her to go on a rampage through Prithian and the continent taking care of this infestation. Um, I've and always had herself. like a theory that the only time Nesta is going to – we're going to see Nesta's like full power is it's going to take something like her losing Cassian. And I think that's when like her name like Lady Death will come more to like fruition. Mm-hmm. That like she will wield – all items of the dread trove and we're going to see her full power where she will just start literally like you said decimating and i have a full mm-hmm. i just feel that in my soul that that's gonna, like the only thing that's going to shake her to her core is the loss of cassian because cassian is like this idea of like she looks at herself as she literally says it she's like you are good cassian you are good and like i'm not good and she's gonna lose like the only good thing that she has like the fact that someone so good could love her and that's also kind of like playing back on herself. Like, then I am now not lovable by anyone good because he loved me and he was good. and like the mm-hmm. only person. And I think it's going to just send her spiraling into rage of loss of her mate, rage of like everything that she's been through and gone through. And I think that's when all items of the Dread Trove are going to come out full stop. Like, she's going to go destroy and I'm going to be... You know that Cars meme when it's like, Lightning McQueen? Yeah. That's going to be me. But it's going to be like, Nesta! Yeah. Like, yeah. Because I love her so much. There's so much <laughs> well, going it's, on. It's just so telling in this scene that she is like, quickly, quickly. Like, they're like, hurry up, Reese is coming, Reese is coming. That is, like, that was such a telling moment for me where I'm like, things why, are not why as they should be. Why do you think, be. like, Reese couldn't winnow, like – quickly there well you can't win it to the house wind you have to Uh, probably because right probably because he gave his we haven't seen reese okay we have not seen reese show his full power since the end of akawar when he's brought back to life does he not have he dies and he's pulled back if power is incremental and you can give chunks of it away to bring somebody back to life like he comes back to life we never see him use his full power again does that mean he's just oh. like normal Reese now? 
he can't save his mate. He doesn't even try. The basically all we see are parlor tricks. Like he has his like darkness in the room. Well, we feel his power. Oh my gosh. But like he doesn't he doesn't miss anybody after that point. He's not like out there killing people. He like, also doesn't use his Demonte powers. Just with Well no, he uses them with Azriel. He lets Bryce But he doesn't um, use he lets yeah, Bryce he touch Bryce. the globe and project it. But no, remember he talks to Bryce in her head and well, he's like asks for permission. Stuff. No, no, but he asks for permission. He does ask like, do I have no, permission to look? And like that's his Demati powers. And she, he's like, oh, you're familiar with these powers. You know? Yeah. So he's still but Demati. He do- but yeah, I guess that's true. But he hasn't scrambled like, anybody's brains know. like eggs. You don't know to I, what I level. still disagree. I still disagree. Like, I still think that there's more there. Like, it was very weird for, like, Resan to be this, like, portrayed so badly in, like, Silver Flames and Crescent City 3. But then he all of a sudden has, like, this, like, second of moral com- compass and conscience. Like, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Where's the bravado? Where is Resan mm-hmm. being I, I who is. I think he 100% would have went into her head where is reese who's like the savior of the world in akawar who's like we're gonna protect everybody i stand for humans and then bryce is like uh, literally showing him like all the humans on my planet are being systematically murdered and he's like sorry boss Mm -hmm. can't do anything about it that's not the reese and i know but that's not the that's not the reason of akamath or the beginning of akawar like I think it's because he's he a helpless. Kid yeah, but he and yeah. his mate, he's stupidly tied his fate to his mate. And then he lost all, in my opinion, I think he lost all of his power. Amarin went into the cauldron, died, came back out, no power. So you're telling me there's zero consequence for Resan dying and coming back? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. You're the most powerful High Lord to ever live. And you are terrified of Nesta Archeron? Oh, God. I don't, I do not buy it. Nesta has to kill that one that I'm pretty sure was Volg in Silver Flames, that queen. She has to kill her. Mm-hmm. Resand, nowhere to be seen. Like, like where, are the, where are his helpers? He sends Cassian and Azrael to do all of his dirty work all the time. But it's like, Ka- uh, Resand has the same thing that Maeve had in Throne of Glass where there's like this increase in anxiety and making stupid decisions because you realize you're helpless Maeve does that like throughout Throne of Glass by the end of the series she is working out of like panic because she's like crap like I have screwed myself and now Aelin has all the power she's gonna kill me I'm screwed that is how Reese is acting he's like making foolish rash decisions and it's reminding me of Maeve, which him and Maeve have a lot of parallels. But um, it's giving I lost all my power and I don't want anyone to know about it. <laughs> this is what it's giving me. Um, mm. but, oh my god. Like I you can't, can't winnow up to the house. It seems like a I pretty pivotal like, moment to use your winnow power. Jo on and she's just <laughs> she's gonna just Literally, I knew like <laughs> High Lady Joe was gonna bring it with the things that were gonna make me have anxiety and not be able to sleep at night. Like I knew you were gonna do this. <laughs> oh my god! I'm sorry. Oh, god. I'm literally <laughs> binging Akatar again. I'm gonna binge Throne of Glass. I'm today marks my binge oh, hey, on all the SJM. Not books. to not to self promote, but we are doing an Akatar deep dive on season two of my podcast. So uh, we're going to dive back Absolutely into it. Absolutely self promote the heck out of yourself. Doing, Go ahead. Knowing what we know now, we're so, going to do an Akatar uh, deep dive from the mass. Well, tell them your podcast so. name. Yeah, it's Wine and Wings Fan Pod. We get drunk and talk about theories. It's a good time. <laughs> God, I can't wait to be able to get drunk again. I cannot wait. <sighs> um, okay, so real quick, I think that honestly, like this Crescent City Part Three episode has turned into like um, freaking theories and I'm SJM so sorry, universe, multiverse stuff, which is no, no, I love it. I think it's totally fine. I'll just probably edit the the title because we have been on for like three hours almost at this point. <laughs> 
Um, we've had a lot of technical issues, guys, per usual, because Riverside <laughs> is the best. Um, but let's just get to the ending here real quick. So a bunch of stuff does happen in between. They open the portal to hell. Yay. Love all of them. Love Adius. Love our princes of hell. Um, Hypaxia kills the un- under king becomes the head of flame and shadow i don't it's it's all just so fast it's all just so like random um i will say uh connor and ethan have a really beautiful moment it's really nice that they get to share that Mm -hmm. and they're able to talk to each other i know that made taylor very emotional um and there's whole sidebar where pollock steals the kids not sure like he just was able to steal lydia's kids I, I don't know. That one was a little bit much for me as well. Um, Rune shoots Lydia in the leg. There's just a lot that happens here. But uh, just to give a quick recap, like, you know, um, Lydia and or Therian ends up like breaking all of his antidotes. Ethan breaks all of his antidotes. The antidote isn't a factor really in much of anything. I'm like, what is happening over here? It, it seems like there's a suspense because Therian's like, I only have two left. And then he gives one to Lydia, but then it never makes its way to Bryce. It's all really weird. Um, but, but then she doesn't Lydia even need it. Up... Yeah, I know. I, I hate it. I hate that part. I hate that part. It's one of my biggest things is like the ending is my biggest critique of this book. Um, even though I did yeah. give it five out of five out of five stars. Um, but yeah, so Therian uh, heals Lydia. Lydia goes and kills Pollux and she's like, take my son's rune and I'll forgive you for shooting me in the leg. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, I gotta go do other stuff. Um, Ethan finally arrives with no antidotes, nothing. He just <laughs> gives her the rifle. She shoots the damn first light. Rigelus is like, I could show you the world. And she's like, I don't give a fuck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just rushing through this. So sorry, guys. But I just wanted to give everyone the recap. Um, but yeah, so she's like, I don't care, Rigelis. You, you're not going to show me anything. Shoots it. Um, basically, you know, now that powers the whole freaking world and the whole Crescent City. So that's a whole issue. Um, she opens the portal to nowhere without the cur- without the cure. I was like, ooh. Uh, Bryce dies. Mecha suit hunk- hunt saves the day. Jessica gives her life for Bryce's, and then everyone gets a happily ever after the end. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I think, um, yeah, my favorite moments are um, Rune shooting Lydia is like the funniest thing. I laughed out loud when that happened. I don't know why it just made me laugh so hard because it was honestly the most like Rune to Nan moment of the entire series. Was Rune being like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> just shoots her in the leg like that just felt very like i don't know uh, uh shoot first ask questions later like that was very rude <laughs> and then like during um, a war though I'm, like during a war where she's gonna need her leg <laughs> he's like oh <laughs> but like that is just like so it's so like high on mirthwood like mirth root behavior is to like shoot your girlfriend in the leg yes. because you don't want her to like be in danger so you're like, I don't want you to be in danger, babe. I'm going to incapacitate you. <laughs> like that <laughs> is just like so funny to me. And then probably like the most emotional moment for me was um, Shahar in the mech suit reaching oh. for Bryce. Yeah. And like the moment of all the like all the wings coming to life and like getting into the mech suits. And then, you know, like Shahar is able to do is able to give Hunt what he couldn't do for Shahar. Like he reached for her. He watched her fall. He had, he had to watch her die. And then like Shahar, like Bryce Hunt is having to watch it again. And Shahar's like her final act of love. Cause through the whole like second book and third book, well, probably the second book hunts. Like, did she even love me? Like, she, he's convinced, like, she never even cared. Like, I was just basically warming her bed. Like, I loved her. And I was nothing to her. And, like, Shahar's act of love in that moment of, like, kind of diminishing herself away, the last bits of her soul in order to save Bryce, is, like, so, such a beautiful healing moment for Hunt on so many levels. It's, like, a part of Hunt that never healed. 
of like this love that he gave to her, like sacrificed everything for Shahar and Shahar sacrificed everything for him. It's like such a good moment that unfortunately I felt like was glossed over. I wish that we would have hung on that yeah. a little bit more before Jessica's sacrifice. Because it's like Jessica's sacrifice, you can feel it because she's alive. But Shahar was already dead. So you're like, well, who cares? But it's like she gave up her eternity to give Hunt an eternity of happiness and like closure. And we don't get a lot of closure in books like this where, you know, like we do with Danica mm -hmm. by the end. But like, you know, it's good to have that like that moment wrapped up for hunt like his whole story is kind of wrapped up in this book like he finds out about his parents and he's like okay like i'm not by the end he's like i'm not useless like i i serve a purpose and like everything i've done wasn't for nothing like all the pain i went through it comes full circle so it's really nice and i actually was heartbroken about jessica but i was glad that it happened I just wish that there would have been more build up. It just felt random mm -hmm. for like for yeah, Jessica yeah, to like give herself definitely. in that way. For her to sacrifice herself for Bryce did not feel random. She's been sacrificing for Bryce since the beginning of the first book. But for her to just like walk up and do it out of nowhere <laughs> felt very random. <laughs> yeah. Again, bonus chapter, SJM, give it to me. Like, I would I would buy a fifth copy of House of Flame and Shadow if the bonus chapter had Jessica, like, that whole situation, like, her build up behind and everything. I yeah, would yeah. buy a, a fifth copy. So, um, Sarah, if you want my money, it's yours. Yeah, it was just, like, all of her backstory with the library sounds so interesting to me. I'm like, give me that. I want to know that whole story. It does. How does that connect to Meryl? How does that connect to like Gwyn? Like I want to know all that. The you know? priestesses. That whole thing was – okay, her revelation to Ethan on everything, on like what she is, her backstory. She's not a witch. Like – It's amazing. I just yeah. – I feel so – there was a lot of info dump in this, almost like Aquawar, very similar to Aquawar, like you're saying. Now I'm mm -hmm. having these revelations. Now I'm tying and dotting the dots and all this stuff. And I do feel like it was a massive info dump that was like, here's all this. Now we're going to build even further. And now we're getting to our Akasif moment. And I'm so excited. Um, yeah. Oh, so, gosh. So unfortunately, we have to wrap this up because okay. I have to go – Make sure that the auditions actually do launch tomorrow because at this point it is 7.30 and um, I am starting to freak out. Um, but thank you so much for coming on, Hi Lady Joe. You are such a joy, such a love. Your theories are always so hard hitting, so impactful, so much fun. They, I'm going to be stewing on this probably all night long. All night um, long. I cannot believe the things about Cassian and Nesta and Reese. And I'm just like, I don't even know what to do with that information. All I know is how in the hell are we supposed to wait this long for another book? Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. We really love you and appreciate all of your insights. And we love you as a friend too. So oh, much. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I felt so honored to like when Taylor reached out about coming on because like Bryce means so much to me personally. Just like she helped, she healed a part of me, um, which I won't get into, but um, she's like personally, like really, really means a lot to me. So I always love talking about Crescent City. Um, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's certainly mine. So, um, and I love talking theories as you guys know. So thank you for having oh, me Oh, heck on. yeah. I really appreciate it. We are so happy you came on. Like literally this was such a joy. Though you gave me an insane amount of anxiety I did not have <laughs> prior to this episode. Um, uh, my baby Cassian, my Galanesta, I... I am not feeling well. I am not now feeling well. But I love you so yeah. much. Um, you so, love much. You so much. Right, okay. Everybody. Well, follow Joe at Hi Lady Joe on TikTok and Instagram, correct? 
Yes. Highlighted Joe, all the places. Oh, do you see and the balloons? <laughs> Did you see I the love balloons? it. <laughs> What was that? <laughs> um, follow us at Whimsy Gossip on all the socials. Our auditions are open now for Akawar Chapter Ooh. 69 and 70. Our crowdfunding campaign is live. Links are down below in all of our socials. Donate, donate, donate. Every dollar counts. Yes. You can also support by subscribing to us on Instagram or you can buy our merchandise all of the links are down below, and we just really appreciate the support from this community. We need it more than ever to make this a reality, and we cannot wait to see everyone's auditions. And side note, really quickly, hi, Lady Joe. Do me a favor. Tell me your Instagram, your TikTok, also your podcast, and where everyone can find you coming up because I know you have a couple events coming. Sure. So I my personal stuff is hi, Lady Joe just j-o no ease um on everything i'm on threads instagram tiktok uh even facebook and youtube um uh my podcast is wine and wings fan pod and we are at wine and wings fan pod also on everything so um we're everywhere you listen to podcasts and um also threads instagram tiktok all that stuff um i've got a whole schedule listed on my instagram but um Coming up, I'm going to be at Alexia, actually, as Bryce Quinlan. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and especially with all, like, the CC3 hype. So um, I'll see lots of, I'm sure, your listeners there in Orlando in May. Um, I've also got Night in Terrace M. We talked about Maeve today. I'll be portraying uh, Queen Maeve uh, at Night in Terrace I'm going to die. Ah, uh, it's going to be so fun. I've got my dress and everything. I'm making it. So there's some fun stuff with that. Um, spidery things. Um, I've also got Bookish Babes Retreat. Again, Bryce Quinlan. Um, so if you can't catch me as Bryce at um, Starfall at Alexia, I'll be there at Bookish Babes Retreat. And tickets are still on sale for both Bookish Babes and Night in Terrasen. Um, And I'll be at Under the Mountain. Uh, Fantastic's Under the Mountain as the Adder. We'll that there. one's going to be real fun. I know I'm very excited that you guys are going to be there. Um, and I've got some things next year that I can't talk about yet, but uh, I will be at a lot of other balls this year, not as a cosplayer, but working. So I'm sure if you go to a bookish event this year, I'll probably see you there. Yay! Awesome. That's so exciting! <laughs> Okay. Well, I love you so much, Joe. I love you I love so you. much, Tay. So much. And we will catch you guys hopefully next week for another episode. It's kind of an every other week thing lately. Sorry. There's just been so much <laughs> going on, everyone. Yeah. Um, especially launching auditions and trying to get this film figured out. It's been a lot of different behind the scenes work plus, you know, freaking pregnant as heck now. So this is real fun. Um, but yeah, so we'll catch you guys hopefully next week for another episode of whimsy gossip thank you for joining us and uh yeah i love you guys love you bye guys bye, bye. bye.